Uh, hi, um, my name is Jagan Jagannathan. I'm the CTO at Zengadi, and um, welcome to everyone here. Um, we are going to talk about requirements and Zengadi uh, implementations of these requirements, which are critical to managing the virtual infrastructure, whether it's for a line of business applications or it is for VDI implementation. Uh, feel free to ask questions uh, as you have them. I uh, want to keep this interactive. So, you know, there are really, the, the thing which I think a lot of people are coming to grips with is that virtualization has changed a number of different things, but the most important thing that it has changed is it has made uh, silos disappear. So what were previously the network silo, which was managed by network management, tool, management tools, or the server silo, which is managed by, by the server tools, uh, or the desktop silo managed by other tools, they were silo specific, different individuals managed it. Now what you have is with virtualization, all those silos, the walls between the silos have collapsed, they are intertwined and the silos themselves had to be uh, dealt with by a single person or a group of people who are responsible for all different aspects of it. So you, in virtualization, you're dealing with networking, you're dealing with um, uh, servers, you're dealing with storage, you're dealing even with desktops and um, user um, clients that have information that you want to get to. So one of the key requirements in virtualization is what I call cross silo. So what does cross silo mean? It's intuitive what it means. Cross silo means you got to deal with the network data, you got to deal with the server data, server meaning the I'll just put in parentheses the typically the hypervisor data. You got to deal with the storage, and you often have to deal with what I would call as endpoint, but think of it as things like desktops and clients. Okay. Uh, important po point here. One of, the, one of the things that we could afford to do when we just were dealing with, say, a network silo or a storage silo or a server silo or an endpoint silo is we were able to perhaps deploy agents. So these are pieces of software that you deposit uh, in probably other software so that you get information that you want, you know, exactly the information you want. It's a great thing to have if you can afford to put these agents. What this combination has done is it is much, much harder now to have a universal agent that can be scalably deposited into an increasing number of different hypervisors, different storage vendors, and different kinds of desktops and clients and tablets and so on and so forth. So there is already resistance to agents, but agents are less and less um, relevant in this new world. So part of doing this is to be able to do it using what I call native feeds. What this means is that you have to actually get information that is already available in the network silo, in the server silo, in the storage silo, in the endpoint silo. Take this network silo, for example. Uh, you'd have something called NetFlow. NetFlow a summarization of all the traffic that's flowing in the network, which is voluminous, and it's actually pushed out by routers to you, um, and you know if you are analyzing it. So it is voluminous, and it's pushed out. So remember the direction being pushed out, and it is coming at you continuously. Whereas something like a service silo hypervisor, a hypervisor, a typical hypervisor, will not push out this information because it's busy doing all kinds of other things. So what it's going to do is it's going to say, I'm going to collect this information quietly, and when you want it, come and get it. So from the analyzer's standpoint, they or the monitoring standpoint, you have to discreetly pull or pull this data every time you want it. So 
each of these silos, and different silos and different vendors have different styles, you have to either deal with data that's pushed at you continuously, or deal with data that is reluctant and sitting in the, at the, in, within that particular environment, and you have to go get it, okay? So native feeds, push versus pull, continuous versus discrete. And the other, the other aspect of cross-silo which is important is it has to be extensible. And what do I mean by this? Extensible means that you're not going to ever have a day where you say, okay, I got all the different vendors and all the different types of information I want covered. I'm done. Let's focus on some other part of the system. This is always going to change. It's always going to change because there's evolution in technology. It's always going to change because um, hypervisors keep evolving. Different versions of hypervisors are going to change. Storage keeps evolving, and there's dramatic growth in innovation in storage. So all these things contribute to the fact that th the way to meet this requirement is not only deal with native feeds, but you have to be extensible. So I'll leave, it, leave the um, hang on while I disappear from your screen. I leave the cross silo part there. And what I'm going to talk about just quickly is what Zengadi does. Zengadi, I'm going to draw this right here. If I, if I can, so Zengadi has something called collection. And it basically deals with network, it deals with server, it deals with storage, and it deals with endpoints as of today, right? So network has things like NetFlow, SNMP, LDAP, DNS, AAA radius. These are examples of different kinds of data that we get from the, the network side. Um, server, you know, if you, if you look at something like VMware, server, we deal with the vSphere APIs. And for other hypervisors, it will be similar. If you look at endpoints, which are desktops and clients, we deal with uh, information for, from Teradici and from Citrix to give you desktop stats. And we also deal with Windows. I'm sorry, I hope you can see it. Windows is helping you give you information that you typically get from a task manager. So even if, you, even if it's a system which has, does, is not a desktop and is not dealing with desktop session protocol, you can get the, the Windows specific information, uh, which can be useful when you're trying to debug why a particular um, system is slow. So let me just let me. So this is what Zengari does right now. But you can see that each of these areas, we're going to be adding stuff and extensively so as we encounter um, new types of data that we want to look at. So the second the second thing I want to look at here today um, is a requirement which I think is not. not very well known, at least in the management world. And live and continuous, what does that mean? Now, I think if you, if you put your security hat on, live and continuous is the only way security systems work. You know, you, you have uh, an intrusion, you have a, uh, an unusual event going on, you want to track it and deal with it immediately because time elapsed means you're not going to be as effective in finding out what happened. And there's also what I'd like to contrast with, with is the, the world of uh, emergency care. So, you know, I think there is a lot of premium attached to dealing with someone who is really sick right then and there and deal with whatever is going on as a, as a triage kind of, uh, in a triage kind of environment. But if you deal with it post-fact, 
whether it's by reports or you know the equivalent of reports, discrete reports every five minutes, the patient may be unfortunately gone in some cases. So it really becomes triage versus postmortem. And you know it's it's maybe the analogy is a bit of a bit of a stretch, but I think it really captures the the criticality of uh, performance management, which is that. When you have a virtual infrastructure and something goes wrong, you really have to deal with those issues immediately. And if you wait, you might be dealing with why things uh, ended up getting broken um, rather than how to prevent them from breaking. So it's really proactive versus reactive. You know, it's all the things that people talk about in effective management. So live and continuous. Live means um, current, right? It means tell me what's going on right now. Continuous means tell it to me second by second. So this is this is just to contrast this with is um, past, recent past, and discrete would be the opposite of this. And this is, this is the, the world of management maybe we have seen for the last 20 years is you get reports from a few minutes ago, five minutes ago, they're detailed reports, but they're telling you something which happened an hour ago, uh, a day ago, and you have to actually kind of refresh them every once in a while to get it updated. The key thing with live and continuous is that the reason it's important is because you have such a dynamic system, because all these elements that you have in your virtual infrastructure are interacting, you have to understand what the transient behavior is. And what I mean by transient behavior is there might be storage latency between a VM and a data store which comes and goes. It comes maybe once, every, you know, whenever there's a write going on from the VM where the latency may be substantially higher than you expect, and it might go down to a very nominal level when the VM is not doing that. If you look at an average over a five minute period, you will see that that particular distribution where it looks something like this, you'll end up, it'll end up looking something like this. Because you're projecting, you're averaging it over a certain amount of time. So, so the point is to be able to see this peak is, is important. It's not even as important as to what the peak is as long as you're reasonably close, but the fact that this is happening often is a telltale sign of something quite different than saying that the storage uh, latency appears to be slightly higher. So this is true of everything we do you know, in, in a management context. So, you really want to look at things as close to live and as continuously as possible because otherwise you'll never track the, the, the transient behavior which is really important because transients doesn't mean they come once and go forever, go out forever. It means they come periodically and the end user experiences the effect of the transient, not the effect of the, the stuff around it. So, the way Zengati deals with live and continuous is we don't, we have a database, but we don't use it for, for processing data live. So we have a memory based um, engine that takes all the data that is available and crunches it and what we call what I would call collate, which is get the raw information, map it, account it, check if it, uh, you know, do profiling, check if there are alerts, do visualization, all those things are done in memory. And what this means is that you need both algorithmic and data structure innovation to, to be able to do that on a, you know, to keep up with live and continuous, just to give you a sense of it. If you're dealing with maybe 100,000 objects in your virtual infrastructure, uh, having interactions or metrics 
about a range of 10 per object. You're dealing with a million interactions. You've got to deal with that as it's occurring every second. And one millionth of a second is a microsecond. So you cannot do this in a database as flexible as it is because its latencies are in the milliseconds. And what you want to deal with is a processing rate that is compatible with micro. So it's really the difference between these two which uh, forces us to go to a memory-based approach. Now, we, we still have a database in our system for reports. We certainly need it. But reports, you know, are not in the framework of live and continuous, as we have discussed. Any questions so far? So, so milli is for to the 1,000th of a yeah. second, and micro is to the 1 millionth. Right, exactly. Got it. And you're processing on the micro level. That's exactly right. Thanks. Okay, so I'm going to erase some of this stuff um, and go to the next requirement. And the next requirement is what we call scalability. Now this is, you know, I'll, I'll grant you everybody wants to be scalable. There isn't any system where I <laughs> say, well, we don't want to be scalable. Everybody wants to be scalable. So but what does it mean in the context of performance management? Well, the things that a performance management system has to deal with are the number of objects in the system. What, I, what do I mean by objects? They could be VMs, they could be hosts, they could be uh, IP addresses, they could be uh, network interfaces. Any, any element in your infrastructure is typically an object. So scalability means that you have a performance management system for today which deals with, say, uh, 10,000 objects and you're migrating to an environment which is 100,000 objects. Maybe you're dealing with a much larger um, environment. You don't want to be in a position where the system you have or the solution you have does not grow the number of objects. The other thing that can change even if you stay with 10,000 objects is you're getting much more interaction between these objects. Okay, You have put in applications where these objects, the VMs interact with each other a lot more. The VMs and data stores interact with each other a lot more means that it's more I.O. intensive, it's more CPU intensive. So even with the same number of objects, you might have more interactions. You want the same solution to be able to deal with it. And so scalability has to do with this idea that, that you can grow from small number of objects and interactions to a large number of objects, interactions, and or interactions, right? So you can have either or both. Okay. And what you find is that if you have the wrong technology choice in how you implement the solution. If you are database based or if you are, it may work beautifully when you have a thousand objects. It may not architecturally work when you have a hundred thousand objects. So scaling is not, is not saying that one particular uh, appliance will deal with any, any size. It's more saying that the architectural choices you have made can can deal with the, the range of um, complexity of the environment. Okay. So this is an important part of, of what Zengadi does. And in Zengadi, I think the approach we have taken is we have, we have a, you know, as, as we have mentioned, we have a memory-based uh, collation which allows us, you know, microsecond Handling, object handling time, and we have native data collection, which means we're not deploying more and more agents. Uh, supposing you move from, you know, 10,000 to 100,000, imagine how many, if you have agents, you're going to be deploying a lot more, which is an IT nightmare, quite frankly, even if the agents are 
uh, universal, which they most often aren't. So you basically have to, these two things that Zagari does, which is no agents, these two the, uh, things that Zangari does actually help in, um, in making our system very scalable. Okay. Now the last thing that I, that I want to mention as a requirement is focusing on interactions. And I'll, I'll go ahead and erase this piece. And just to add to this, pyramid as we move along, uh, the, the piece that focus, focuses, and uh, this is related to interactions, is what I'd call alerting. And uh, focus, focused on, on interactions means something which I think is not very common in performance uh, management. So performance management typically deals with the vital information of an object. So if you have a VM, you're looking at its CPU, its memory, its disk utilization, its network bandwidth. And that's it. So those are like your pulse rate, your oxygen level, your temperature, your blood pressure. They, when they go haywire, obviously it's a symptom of something wrong, right? But they are what, what we call consumptive measures meaning you know you're using you know the, it, it basically reflects a property of the object it doesn't say anything about why the object is in the state so it's a consumptive measure interaction on the other hand is talks about how objects interact with each other okay so when you go to a doctor and you have a temperature sometimes they'll ask you what you did the previous day, what you ate, if you have a stomach flu, whatever it is, what they're trying to do is they're trying to identify interactions between different objects. And what is fundamental to the way Zingari does things is we look at interactions at the same level as we look at consumptive measures. So we have consumptive metrics, which all performance management tools have, and we have interaction metrics, which is which data stores does a VM talk to, which host interacts with which other hosts, because if they are have an affinity to each other for the uh, you know motion of VMs or whatever it is, that's important information. And you can look at which network interfaces are used or which port groups are used. And those things are, are information that we gather and that information is actually used to drive our, our alerting. So in our alerting, not only do we say what the symptoms are, but we also tell you how the symptoms relate to each other, right? And symptoms often, not always, symptoms often describe effects, okay? They tell you you're sick. They don't tell you why you're sick. Interactions will will have the potential to take you to what the uh, causes are. Okay, that's part of the diagnosis that you end up doing where you chase down certain interactions because you feel like it's going to establish what the cause is of the way you, you feel. And same thing for objects. Object has a high CPU, it may have nothing to do with what, you know, something natively that the object is doing. It may have a high CPU because it was asked to do something by some other object. And that object may have asked this to do something because it had trouble perhaps reading something from the data store. So, you know, the causality is something that you have to establish interactionally. And what happens is if you just say, I have all these objects that are alerting, you go figure out what the interactions are. That's a tall order. That's why people don't like, quote, alerts or too many alerts is because basically you're saying that to them, you've got a bunch of sick people, figure out what's in common, right? So that is why interactions are very important and what Zengari does is it looks at both con consumptive and interactional metrics 
and its alerting engine not only will identify the symptoms which usually come from consumptive metrics but will also identify you know the, the, co the common cause of why the symptoms were created by chaining these symptoms together and that is really relating to interactional metrics okay so those are the four requirements what I would also add very quickly is the thing you will see about the Zengadi product is its visualization and you know you have recordings you have visual trouble ticket and so on and so forth very powerful but visualization is fueled by being cross-sidled 